please tell us your name and a little bit about you so we can get to know you a little bit better, please? Sure. My name is Tracy Dokes. Uh, I am a graduate of the engineering school here in North Carolina. I won't say which one. Uh, very, very proud of it. Um, uh, currently, I am the CEO of uh, MCNC, which provides um, high-speed fiber across the state. And prior to that, I was the state CIO working in the governor's cabinet. And so I am yeah, married, two kids, um, uh, and particularly focused on my black son. Okay. And so do you have concerns about your children? Um, uh, how old are they? Are they old enough for them to be out and about on their own without you, or are they still uh, at home? So my daughter is 25, and so she, she just graduated law school, so she'll be out. You know, she's got her own place now, working for a law firm, um, and away from that very sheltered um, college, university uh, community. And uh, my son is 20, and he goes to NC State. So he is on campus currently, and a very heavy uh, um, uh, studier of society, socialism, all of the things that um, we take for granted and his generation looks at in a different way, certainly from a different perspective. And yeah, I do worry about both of them very much. So I have known you for maybe 10, 11 years and I have seen your career grow exponentially. Um, you're a senior leader at Duke Health. Um, you said about your time at state and now in MCNC. Can you tell us how is it that you have been able to be so successful and what, what have you had to let go and what have you had to gain in order to maintain that success? So I attribute my success besides all of the, you know, the normal attributes that you would expect as base foundational, right? But it really is networking. My network and, and I say this all the time, especially to young um, black women who are starting out, finding your tribe, your tribe of people who support you, who speak your name with positivity and integrity and remember you when things come about. And so my reputation for me has been everything mm -hmm. and every job I've gotten for the last, I don't know, 20 years has been by word of mouth, not by me applying for something. Yeah. And it, yeah, it's been by somebody knowing my reputation and asking them if I'm interested. And so um, that's the way, yeah, the last 20 years or so, my um, opportunities have come about, but it had everything to do with my network. It's, it's tough in Research Triangle Park to be in a network that at least used to be predominantly men, but women, uh, particularly in technology, we are starting to grow and build our own network so that we can also hire people that look and smell like us too and, uh, and, and kind of get away from uh, the, the um, uh, such a minority of women and people of color in technology. The thing that I had to let go was my ego. So I've had some really tough experiences in my journey that, um, I, I won't lie, that hurt me deeply, but shaped me greatly. Mm -hmm. um, where I knew I was clearly being um, sidelined, but my ego, ego wouldn't let me go down. So I just kept fighting and fighting and fighting. And I think at some point that kind of energy um, that you're expending can be negative to your spirit. Yeah. It really can be. And, and you, you have to figure that out early, uh, sooner than later, so that you can say, okay, this is not the right place for me. I need to make a change for my spirit in order for me to continue to be a good person and someone that is moving forward. So, um, and, and that's a different thing to get rid of your ego. 
it really is. I'm not known as a conceited, arrogant person, but there's still in all of us an ego that kind of keeps us, you know, when we feel like we're being discounted, that we want to fight. We want to know, I'm going to show you. And a lot of times it's not about them. Just the, release them <laughs> and either create your own thing or find out where else you might be welcome so that you can make a change. And uh, I think that was one of the hardest things for me to do is to be discounted and allowing my ego to just fall by the wayside. And, and it was good for me to do that. And I think that your success in doing that is probably attributable to the success you have now. But I will tell you as a black woman, um, 45, 46 plus years of experience, never been, never, never missed a deadline, never have a project not coming on time. And like you, I have a community, but for me, my community is not one like you speak of, right? So I let my ego go a long time ago. You know, I, I'm done with it. You know, the labels that are attributed to me, like, okay, that's what you think of me. I, I can't, can't worry myself about that. But the key is, is how do people like you and others see what's happening to black and brown people? And I would even say women of all gender, all races, you know, and, 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 and bring them along, you know, and bring them with you or introduce them to your network or explain to them how to create their own tribe, as you described. I think that's really an important thing because, you know, it's sort of like some of us get so high up, we forgot how we got there and you don't look back down to see all the people shoulders you stood on to get where you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I stay very connected to the people who got me where I am from the person in college that knew that I was struggling to feed myself and found a little part-time job for me. I still know that person and I interact with her. And when she needed help a few years back, I helped her mm -hmm. because it was the right thing to do. And because I remembered that someone did that for me, she gave me a chance and she did many other things that she did um, that really helped me significantly as I was trying to learn and grow with a whole bunch of obstacles in my way, as well as um, today I spend a lot of time with other nonprofits that are female-based or female and people of color, um, because I think it's important. I remember feeling isolated in college because of the predominantly um, male-oriented um, groups and cliques that um, kind of congregated together. And, and, and so as a female, it's hard to break into those things. And so um, there's a, several organizations. So there's one called Corral Riding Academy out in Cary. And it is a horse farm and they do um, equine therapy for at-risk girls, mm -hmm. mainly um, girls of color. And they start at middle age. A lot of these girls have come from very abusive homes, not very supportive communities around them. And the job of and the mission for this group is to help change that for them and their families. And uh, I sit on the board of that group. I talk to the girls, I volunteer there so that they can see that there is a way out of there, that there's somebody that um, looks and smells like them that is different and is doing something different. And uh, I think that's really important. Um, I spoke at their graduation this year so that I could get an expanded group of girls, you know, some of it was um, on site, but most of it was online and really trying to get more donors for that, um, the mission of that group so that they could continue to um, educate and support our girls throughout the summer when they were, they had nothing to do. A lot of them didn't even have high speed internet access. So that usually smells, uh, spells trouble for girls like that and you know try keeping those summer programs up and keeping them engaged so they also don't get behind 
um, when everyone else is starting school. So, I mean, that's that's just one example. Uh, Sue Harnett, who does uh, rewriting the code, is very, very focused on um, STEM girls across the country and having a tribe and a network, um, even if it's uh, across the U.S. and I believe Canada, so that there is a connection between um, each girl and some companies that help support and fund some of the work that they do. It's been tough for them this year because of COVID. A lot of those girls lost their internships and offers were rescinded. So, you know, being able to come back and, and try to inspire the girls to hold on and to encourage other companies to you know, as they're getting back on their feet to remember that those internships that um, went away to, to make sure they find a way to get those back and the offers that were rescinded. So um, I do spend time in nonprofits that are focused on those things. Does your network also include just people who you know in STEM, in STEM areas? No, no, not at all. And I think that's important. Um, it, it, one, there's just not that many of us, right? And two, the, I, I think we're getting stronger, but all the power is not ours yet. Will it ever be? I don't know. I don't know in our lifetime, but it is certainly spreading out a little more than it has, which I'm thankful. Um, it, but I will say um, I do get tapped a lot for stuff. It's like, well, would you be interested in this? Would you? And, and it's almost like, and, and I get it, you know, it's like, whoa, she's a black woman and she's doing stuff and Black Lives Matter and we're trying to be diverse and how about we and it's like, I don't have that kind of time. And there's plenty of other people out here um, that have the time, the inclination, the energy um, to, to do that. It, that. That's the thing that I struggle with a little bit is, oh, there's one. Let me you know, tap into that one. So I do think uh, we need to publicize ourselves more so they don't just see one or two of us. Interesting. So I have a question, it might be an uncomfortable question, but do you think that you are still in the work environment, still a black woman or are you simply just a woman? I'm always gonna be a black woman. There's no way around that. I'm always gonna be a black woman and I'm gonna carry that with me no matter what. I'm always gonna be a woman. And um, now I was hired uh, because of my skills and what I could do um, with and for MCNC. I'm known for being able to manage services, build new services, cost structures, um, new models for how you cost recover costs. I know that that was a major part of why I was hired. Um, but I don't think anybody can neglect the fact that I'm a black woman. I just don't think in this instance, I was higher because I was one. Now, what I will say about the state, um, Governor Cooper had the most diverse cabinet in the history of North Carolina. And that was truly amazing to be a part of that and the strength in numbers and, and how, you know, it was like normal conversation, but most of us were, um, that actually um, the white male was the minority in the cabinet. So it was very, very conversation, particularly when we got to Black Lives Matter and how we wanted to handle that and how the governor supported us in the way that we did it. Excellent. So, you mentioned Black Lives Matter. Tell me what that means to you when you hear that phrase. I, I'll put it to you this way. It should always matter. And it's a sad day when we have to get megaphones out and remind people or 
to tell people that. It, that hurts me to my soul that we are at that place. Um, for someone who has um, a black son, that has always mattered. Black lives have always mattered to me because I've always seen discrimination, bigotry coming from a really small town in the valley. That happened to me all the time. It was not new. So I watched, worked through, and maneuvered, navigated through um, a world like that my whole life. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's gotten way more violent and way more visible. Um, I'm probably more violent first and more prevalent and then more visible. And um, it, it hurts. It hurts every time I see a new um, incident that's come about. I worry for my son, but, you know, getting pulled over, something happening, because he's, he's, he is down for the cause. He's got the dreadlocks. He is very, very um, civil rights oriented and has no shame in his game about talking about that very vocally. He also understands, because his sister is a the lawyer, what his rights are, and we'll be quick to say that, but that still doesn't mean that he can't get hurt. So that, that, that scares me for him, my husband, you know, my, my, uh, my brother, uh, it, it just, and, and I've gotten to the point now, and I hate to say it, I, I hate to say this publicly, but it's true. The um, George Floyd video I could not watch. It hurt me so, so much. So, so much as a mother and hearing that he was calling out for his own, that could be my son. That could be my son. And so um, Black Lives Matter is so important. I just, I'm just struggling to see a change. Now, for my son's generation and my daughter's generation, what I will say is when they interview for jobs, their first question is, what's your diversity look like? Can I see your numbers? And my daughter, when she was searching for law firms, that was what she wanted to know. So I do think there's a generation coming that is not going to settle and they're going to be a little pickier about um, where they're going to go because they want they want to go where they know they have a chance, <clears throat> and they want to be able to use that opportunity to reach back. And so, for my daughter, for example, pro bono work was really important to her because she works on the Innocence Project, and she wanted to be able to continue to do that. So you've got a generation of people that are coming up that look at things much differently and it's not just i um for them they they want to live the life they want to live the life of diversity not just trying to find pockets where there is diversity if that makes sense yes yeah well i i would just tell you so when i think about black lives matter um, I think I'm, I feel a little bit differently than you do, probably because I'm much older than you are. But, but I will say, you know, like, I think Black Lives Matter. And I often give this analogy. The way Black lives are in America, and maybe globally, I can't say, I don't know what other countries are doing, but it's like you call, there's a house on fire. You call the fire department. The fire department arrives on the street, and they start pouring water on all the houses that are not on fire. They're just sitting there. And the house over here that's on fire is going to burn to the ground. And when that yeah. house is burnt to the ground, there you go. So, you know, I am not optimistic. I, like you, have a son, too. I have a son who has had a chronic health condition ever since he was about 15 or 16 years old. I don't know I remember exactly when. And so my son is extremely affable. He's pleasant. He's easy to get along with. He's not controversial. In fact, he would prefer to be away from you than with you. So, you know, when he started going to college, you know, we would have these conversations, you know, like, tell us as soon as you get there, tell us when you, where you're going, you know, monitoring him, you know, almost like a helicopter pa parent for a, 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 a man, you know, start trying to make sure, you know, and he's constantly telling me nothing is going to happen to him. 
And I'm I'm willing to bet many of those young men who died, Terry Ron's Martin mother probably thought never nothing would ever happen to him. She 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 probably thought that, that wasn't gonna happen to him. You know, and the fact that we live in a space where as black parents, we're constantly cautioning our children on how to survive in a world where we're almost invisible. So when I asked you the question earlier, were you a, a woman or a black woman in your role at MCNC? Because to me, it's hard to break that part because you know those little things that go on behind your voice, those subtle comments, you know, those little little subtle actions that remind you that you are who you are. And, and, and it also goes back to the other thing when I asked you, you know, I mean, like, so what you said about your charity work is absolutely wonderful, but for the women that you know, like me, how many of us have you remembered and where we have, what we've done and contributed? And to me, that's what Black Lives Matter means, that you are advocating for someone who you know. Now, if the person is a total goofball, I get it. Don't, yeah. no skin in the game. I'm not, not putting my name on anything, but... Yeah. From those in middle and school all the way up to people who have been in a career like me for 40 some years, we're still struggling to be accepted, heard, and not be invisible. And yeah. so every time I, I see something on LinkedIn about you, you almost look like a woman. You never look like a black woman. It's like you're a woman. And so obviously your skin color defines you're a black woman. You look like a black woman and all that stuff. You know, I'm sure you know how to code switch and you're talking and all that stuff. You know, all the things that we as black people know how to do. But yet still, black lives matter to someone. I don't think we matter to ourselves as much as we matter to white folks. Because, you know, you can walk down the street, and I, this is my experience, walk down the street and speak to a black woman, she put her head down and not acknowledge you, you know, or she'll call, someone will call me, a woman called me the other day, she said, I've been unemployed since this thing started, can you help me get a job? I knew, I met this woman once, I didn't know whether she could do the job or not. I picked up the phone, I called somebody, she had a job the next day. Yeah. That's an unusual experience. That's not the common experience. It's not, but I will tell you, now that hiring people has been probably my number one priority for the last few years. Black people, black people, people of color, or women or both. And so, for example, I met a young lady on Facebook. She was talking, it was on one of the Triangle Black Owned Businesses sites, and she was talking about, uh, I guess she was asking, does anybody have an opportunity out there? Yeah. Like, okay, that's bold. Let me send her a note back. And uh, we went out for coffee the next day. And she had a job as my executive assistant within two weeks. And she was the absolute best assistant who wants to get into IT. So for her, that was kind of uh, getting in the door. And then I had people mentoring her across the different technologies so she could get a feel for where she might want to fit. Then there have been other women that I have hired. Sometimes they already have jobs, but I think they'd be really good um, at somewhere else, especially if, if we were working together as a, you know, as a leadership team. Uh, and then there are others that I will um, recommend to other people. And I, I do that a lot. I do that quite a bit. Now, my only downside of that is so as the state CIO, hired a lot of people who came to work with and for me. And leaving has been really tough for them. <laughs> and uh, and now they're all asking, well, is there going to be a place for me where you are? Is there going to be a place for me where you are? And, and you know, it's just reminding people you also have to stand on your own two feet. Um, I had to make a choice that was good for me and my family. Uh, but you're going to be okay, and I'm going to be here. And so I'm having, you know, Zoom cocktails with them so they can ask me questions <laughs> and feel supported as we move through this and, and stay connected in case another opportunity comes up that I might be able to pick up the phone and say, hey, so-and-so, they are good people. How about we connect her with that and do this? And so um, I absolutely have used my journey, experience, expertise, and reputation 
to do that. Excellent. Absolutely. We have, we have about five minutes, so I'm going to leave the remainder of the time for you for any comments or thoughts or things we did not cover you wish to share. Um, I think, uh, you know, as STEM, as we call it, you know, people in STEM, people of color in STEM, women in STEM, at some point it's all going to be STEM. And then if you add the A, which is the art part, right, and then, and then it's STEAM, but Technology is everywhere. It's in everything we do. It's in my refrigerator. It's in my car. It's in everything you do now. And I think it's just so pervasive that eventually it is going to open up the world for lots of people to be a, um, what's considered STEM because it just goes across everything. I see it in farming. I see it in, of course, manufacturing. It's always been there. That's where I started. Um, I, I see it in odd places that you wouldn't normally see it. And so what I tell people is don't be afraid of your journey because it may take you somewhere you hadn't intended, but it's the right place for you to go. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for chatting with me. 